card is something that PO will write and throw it on the team. So this is Safe Thursday initiative from us to give something back to the community, learn from each other, to contribute in enhancing our knowledge on SAFE. Right. A quick history, uh, a group of SAFE program consultants and professional scrum trainers, we came together and created this platform called Agile Mania back in 2017. And in 2019, we felt the need to focus more on business agility. Right. And that's where you know, we stumbled upon uh, this framework called Scale Design Framework, which supports business agility. And we started focusing more on uh, SAFE. And SAFE Thursday was started in May 2020 uh, with support from uh, Scale Design. And uh, the intent was to create a safe environment for discussing anything and everything related to SAFE. Uh, today, we have about you know, more than 30, uh, 35 events so far. And we conduct webinars, workshops, and experience saving sessions. And we have about uh, you know, 1,000 plus members across the world. And we launched our web website called www.safethursday.com. So you can visit this website and know everything about this community. And now uh, we have uh, two events every month first and third Saturdays. Right? So the format is we have expert talks, which we are going to do today. We have workshops, lean coffee, and it's a great platform for uh, bloggers. So if you want to contribute in any form, please get in touch with us. Please visit safethursday.com. And quickly, uh, you know, we have a lot of these events coming up. Uh, you know, stay tuned for the next upcoming session, which we are going to announce soon. Okay. Now, uh, for today's Ask an SPCT, an expert, so we have Ashwini. You know, incidentally, Ashwini is also my trainer when I did my uh, implementing SAFE class. He's a very well-known figure uh, when it comes to SAFE. So it, this is in continuation with the last episode of Ask an Expert, where the response was overwhelming and because of lack of time, we could not answer uh, all the questions. So we requested uh, Aswini to conduct another session so that we can cover all the questions that were asked during the session and during the promotion as well. Aswini, are you ready for the rapid fire round? I've heard many large enterprises use large solution safe, but do not do portfolio safe mm -hmm. because my organization is also looking to scale up to a large, large solution safe. I'll give my biased answer again. <laughs> when I say my biased answer, uh, it is not on an article and that's what we have seen in the ground, right? Yeah. Um, one of the things uh, that safe gives you is four configurations, right? Um, that's out of the box. Idea is uh, if you see the framework, I mean, it looks big and you don't know where to start and you want to start somewhere. That's where Essential Safe comes in, where a team of teams start working. And for some of the organizations, I mean, if I can quote their names, uh, again, I'll quote the names if the case studies are on the Safe website. Uh, collectively, me, Preet, and Satyajit, and uh, Atul, if you have worked in an organization, I mean, we may not be able to quote the names because of uh, NDAs. Uh, think about I'll take it from a practical perspective. Think about a company like uh, Philips, which is developing a CT scanner machine, or Lockheed Martin, which is developing a F-16, right? Uh, in that case, you will not be able to develop those solutions, which are large by nature, with just, say, 125 people or so. You will need thousands of people. So that's where multiple trains have to be launched. And we know the concept of a large solution there, right? And there, mostly money is a not a constraint. Mostly, right? Mostly money is not a constraint. They have a multi-year program envisioned, um, maybe five years, 10 years, and few generations of fighter planes, if you, if you may so, so, right? And they also know a high level number. It might take $5 billion for the next five years or something of that sort. That's where they will go for a large solution, uh, safe, as a solution for them, their uh, delivery. Again, uh, portfolio governance will not be there. 
you can always add it up. You can always add it up. If you look at the safe calculation, it looks like now a full safe. Uh, with the portfolio completely implemented, it looks like a full safe. This is where, I mean, we would have still lightweight governance, lightweight operation mechanisms. Uh, maybe what is the organization doing or what safe recommends some of the practices and patterns. I mean, we'll still use it. But the consideration is mostly to get those mission critical solutions out. Um, again, Lockheed Martin's F-16, they would have, they would deal directly with government organizations, governments uh, throughout the world. And they would have a solution intent, which is <clears throat> fixed and variable based on the discussion and the dialogue that they have with the governments and their organization, right? And many a times, I mean, money might come from multiple sources, right? So that's where large solution becomes a separate, um, a flexible configuration for the organization to go for. Um, in a nutshell, I mean, will they not use the portfolio operations and governance? Definitely they might use, uh, but you don't need a specific guideline for that one is the reason that. And also what we have seen on the ground is typically three to 5% of the organizations go for large solution safe, right? So not many, uh, even, some of the organizations which say we are large solution, uh, they are still doing uh, three essential safes in a collaborative way. I would see it that way. Large solution mostly deals with your compliances, uh, human life, uh, so to say, and uh, uh, cyber physical system where hardware, software, and other considerations are when mostly paramount. Uh, thank you, Ashwini. I think uh, there's, there are a lot of confusion around the scrum of scrums. Right. Okay. <laughs> so other frameworks, if you look at access, you know, there is a mention of scrum of scrum, but safe has you no know, specific way of saying, you know, you can schedule it once or twice in a week uh, for the scrum masters to see whether are aligned. Hmm. But there is also a scrum of scrum during the PI plan. Hmm. 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 So I think there is, there are a lot of questions around what do we do uh, during the PI planning in a scrum of scrum? Again, in my biased opinion, I mean, why it was named as a scrum of scrum, not something else during the PI planning, right? Uh, idea is not to confuse people with too many jargons. Uh, and we know from our uh, history of agile delivery that whenever scrum of scrum masters meet, I mean, we call it as a scrum of scrum, right? So that's a usual thing, right? Uh, one distinction you can actually see in the articles and also on the course content is PI planning, we call it as a scrum of scrum sync. Yeah. Uh, SOS sync, uh, a sync meeting, right? Uh, otherwise, art sync, I mean, which you, you call it as just a scrum of scrum and a PO sync. Um, so we don't call it as a sync there. Idea of a scrum of scrum is relatively the same, even if you think about the execution or the PA planning, where we are looking at what is the progress, are there any impediments? The scrum of scrum that happens during the PA planning is about, we have two days. We have scheduled around four, three to four hours on day one, uh, two to three hours on day two for the draft planning and the final planning. So are we on track? So as an RTE, who is called as a chief scrum master for the train, I don't want to wait for all the hours to get exhausted and then ask the scrum masters, are we done? Rather, I would have a checkpoint, maybe every one hour. Again, SAFE also gives you a, a nice, beautiful, Scrum of Scrum checklist, which you can edit, you can add, update, and modify. So that every hour we know, are we on track? Wherever there is an answer of no from a Scrum Master, we know that we need to help them to get it uh, up to the speed so that everybody um, is able to uh, plan together. Idea is the program execution. If I want to tie it back to the core value from SAFE, it's about the program execution. We want to succeed as a program not as an individual team or an individual member, right? So again, Scrum of Scrum, it is called as a Scrum of Scrum because Scrum Masters are meeting. We don't want to add one more jargon there. And uh, that Scrum of Scrum sync is very, very specific for the PA planning itself. And maybe think about PA planning as a, um, like I usually look at it as a four sprints, right? I mean, the first day, first half is executives and the, uh, every leader speaking alignment. The second half is about planning. That's where, I mean, we kind of talk about built-in quality. Um, again, third half is um, again about showing everything that is a transparency. Last half is about uh, getting to a common conclusion. That's a program execution. Again, I'm trying to call that four core, core values 
to the four halves of the PA planning. I would look at it that way. If I look at it as a four sprints, I want those scrum of scrums to make sure that we are on track. Thank you. So Ashwini, the next question that I have. Question that we had was in our organization. We get only few hours to do actual planning during the PI planning, mm -hmm. resulting in ineffective planning and a lot of replanning and changes throughout the PI. Mm -hmm. Leadership believes we can have only basic stories created before the PI planning. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us how much preparation is possible? So there's a question and a related question on the chat says, you know, in, in many cases, uh, product managers want to communicate regular commitments one to two quarters ahead, mm -hmm. rather than wait for the PI planning. Also, many of the big ticket backlog items require more than two to three days to completely deep dive and estimate. How mm -hmm. do we solve these issues? I mean, I'll answer from uh, two or three uh, perspectives. But I'll say it depends. Uh, again, uh, if you want an answer in a nutshell, it depends. Uh, but if you look at the safe events from a team and a program perspective, at a program level, you have an event uh, called as a preparing for PA planning. And for me, uh, the moment PA planning is done, the team start executing, right? So they go for their team level planning. The product manager, business owner, architects, specifically those three roles, uh, they start looking at, I mean, what is the next set of um, backlog items that needs to be refined, right? So that is a continuous process. It is never that uh, suddenly in a PA planning, you come and say, throw a few features and say, okay, these are the features, right? So that should be a continuous process. What is involved? Uh, if you look at the exploration uh, dimension or the exploration aspect in the continuous delivery pipeline in SAFE, uh, we start with hypothesizing, right? So this is where you hypothesize. Maybe, I mean, you are not hypothesizing something for the next PI itself. This is where uh, you called out two or three PIs, right? So what should come up for the next two or three PIs? A little longer term planning. I would call it as a solution roadmap, maybe, right? So what should come up? You start hypothesizing and you start collaborating with multiple parties and maybe business um, with the architects to really see the feasibility and the viability of the solution. And what does it mean for our organization? They start doing that one. And this is where the features start evolving from an one-liner to having an hypothesis to maybe these are the high-level criteria. And as and when you have those features uh, kind of coming up, product owners and product managers are constantly singing up. This is where product managers start getting, okay, these are the next set of um, features that are coming up. And if you remember the team level backlog refinement keeps on happening every sprint. And in SAFE, I mean, we kind of say it is a two viewpoints. The first viewpoint is what is coming up for the next few sprints, which is already kind of planned in the PA planning. Um, do we need to refine it further, right? And the second part is about, is there something called coming up for the next PI? If something is coming for the next PI, uh, do we have any questions? Do we need elaboration? Do we need uh, any answers from the market or the business, right? So we start elaborating on that one. Uh, pretty soon. Uh, it works well because you already have the next one or two iterations in the PI already kind of planned, right? So kind of planned at high level. So it always works well for you to really look at what is coming up for the next PI. And remember IP iteration, innovation and planning iteration is specifically there for that reason. The first five, six days are specifically for that reason where you can go back and forth. You can uh, start maybe breaking them into uh, smaller chunks, story-like chunks, have some high level of estimates. And uh, one of you asked a question, few of them need two, three days. I mean, I can't as a developer, just come and commit to a story. I need to dig into a code. I need to get into, okay, what are the modules I might hit on? What are the uh, kind of functionalities that I might um, actually change? What will it modify for regression, right? So we need to really look at it. And on the question of how much to do, uh, I think in the RTE course, there is a nice exercise that we do that uh, you have a quadrant. If you do too much of a preparation, what is a positive and negative? If you do too less of a pre preparation, what is a positive and negative, right? So it's always a question on if the feature is new, which if the feature is fairly new, you would actually want to dwell deeper and get as many answers as possible and refine them to the furthest extent. 
And if it is a kind of a business as usual, you might just break down into a high level and just go ahead with it, right? Because uh, there is a problem in estimation. You are always going to be wrong, right? So the estimation, you are always going to be wrong. So you don't want to spend too much time. You want to deliberate as much time as possible, as much time as it is required. And for me, it uh, for me, it's also that the backlog items go through three rounds. One is while the team is executing, you are uh, getting uh, things from the market, your product managers, business owners, mostly kind of deliberate on their features. That's the first step, right? The second step is during the IP iteration, during the PA planning, you are breaking them into stories or story like chunks and trying to figure it out I mean, what are the dependencies and stuff, right? So that's a second um, possibility or second place that where you can adjust. The third place is your backlog refinements. Again, team level backlog refinements. Mostly the first iteration is very well known to you. Second, third iteration, you will start refining it further. And also PO syncs and the scrum, mass, scrum of scrum syncs, uh, scrum of scrum will help you to adjust as needed. So you have three chances. So use it wisely. Don't spend too much of time, but at the same time, do elaborate as much required. For some features, it is more. For some features, it's going to be less, right? So I would take that viewpoint. And definitely planning uh, meeting, we are not going away with the Scrum uh, team planning. So you still have a chance to uh, elaborate. You still have a chance to break down. You still have a chance to assign if you are using tools like Jira or anything. Or, I mean, again, uh, re-verify, validate, estimate again. There are multiple chances. Right? So Ashwini, I'll just add on. Do you have guidance on how to appease teams concern for planning? Features plus stories for a full PI. Yeah? So we are currently planning in six week increments, but we are moving to 12 week PIs. Hmm. Um, and teams are not comfortable planning this much work in advance. Again, uh, a practical guideline, right? So if you are moving to a 12 week, uh, I assume that it will be a five plus one iteration, uh, one IP. IP you don't have to plan. Uh, five iterations, uh, maybe as of now, you are planning for almost three iterations, uh, right? I mean, if you are six weeks, right? So when you are planning for three iterations, the next two iterations, um, can you do it at a 50 to 70% comfort level? Can you do it at a 50 to 70%? Again, numbers are mine, not from the uh, 50 to 70% comfort level. What could it mean? Uh, you don't know everything. Uh, you know that these are going to be a priority, definitely a good priority. You know that uh, there is an effort involved and you have a high level viewpoint on the effort. It is not too off. If it is like taking one week, I mean, you might be saying three days to 10 days, uh, not like one week kind of becomes one month, right? So you know the effort. And the third thing that you would also do is maybe the fourth and the fifth iteration, don't load it completely. Maybe load it 50 to 70% or whatever is comfortable for your teams, right? So that way after running one or two PIs, you will have some historical data. Last time we loaded 50%, but uh, it became 50% and we could take more and we, I can actually load up to 70%, right? Uh, you would have that uh, nuances sorted out after one or two PIs. And for me, first two PIs are usually experimentation. Experimentation in the right sense. I mean, don't do too much of an experimentation unnecessarily, but at the same time, uh, these historical data and numbers, make sure you get it. We've been talking a lot about the user stories, right? So who creates user stories in sales? <laughs> right again um see product owners are finally responsible for that one maybe they will start it out but uh, it's a collaborative one right so i think uh, again what ron jeffrey said about card conversation and confirmation i mean still holds good Con conversation is 99 percent, right so card is something that po will write and throw it on the team so to say <laughs> right but uh conversation is something i mean we really want to happen and this where I mean, I would see it as a collaborative effort. I mean, while the product owners have the final authority or, I mean, if you want to call it that way, uh, it's a co-creation, right? So it's still a co-creation like in Scrum, right? Um, conversation and confirmation is where the team and the understands what could be the acceptance criteria and what are the real uh, things that are needed. And trust me, product owners by themselves will not be able to write all the acceptance criteria. The technical viewpoint and the nitty gritties of dependencies is something the team has to give them the viewpoint on. 
and I still gave a not a definitive answer because um, while uh, we have seen uh, multiple teams, product owners actually driving them, but it is far more good always to for the team to get involved. They write themselves the stories. Uh, they get a hang of it, and uh, they also kind of attempt at acceptance criteria. And they become like peers over a period of time, right? So because we want the team also to experience uh, what is the business viewpoint and what's the user viewpoint, right? That's very important. Now, what do you consider the most important task for a scrum master <laughs> at the team level? Now? <laughs> at the team level? <laughs> And if I tell one over the other, it's a bias, right? Uh, and that bias comes on from the context. Um, again, think about this way. If you are starting up a team, um, coaching, mentoring, and helping the team members get to, to get to the nuances of I mean, what a scrum itself becomes a big burden onto the scrum masters. And maybe over a period of time, <laughs> in most companies, Jira becomes your <laughs> main task, right? Like, don't take it, I mean, take it as a light comment, <laughs> right? Uh, again, when I say Jira, it's about, I mean, measuring and growing, right? So that becomes an important task for you, right? And over a period of time, if the teams become matured, um, I would say this one, Scrum Master should become redundant. And you should think about oh, what next for me. I mean, can I handle two teams? Can I do something else? Can I uh, maybe uh, also think about the improvements from different perspective and so on and so forth, right? So it depends. It largely depends, right? So it largely depends on the context you are in. And uh, I give this analogy. A Scrum Master is a coach. And we say coach doesn't give an answer. But for me, Scrum is like uh, swimming. And if you see someone drowning in the water, you don't coach them. You just pull out them, help them there. And next time when you teach them and the third time, I mean, if they're, they're still drowning, I mean, you are not going to teach them again and again, maybe, right? So take this viewpoint, context dependent heavily. Can you please elaborate the concept of enablers? Yeah, and it says, because for me, if you're implementing enablers as an independent entity, you are violating the agile principle of evolving architecture and design. Enablers are not a different entity, right? So they are called so, that's all, right? So if you look at um, all the backlogs, I think, I mean, they have depicted everywhere the features and enablers are together, stories and enablers are together. And uh, even at an organization level, when you talk about an epic, um, the business epics and an enabler epic are also together. So only thing is the capacity allocation. It's about the capacity allocation. Idea is, if I want to run, I need a track. Enablers, I mean, build that track for you, right? Um, that's why uh, we say in safe architectural runway, enablers build the architectural runway. It's an airport analogy. You build a runway, planes come and land, right? So small planes can come and land on a small runway. Uh, but you don't worry about building a complete runway and then landing that small plane. If you're landing a small plane, you will land again, build the small runway, land the plane. Uh, extend the runway over a period of time. You also know your boundary. What is the end? And when the end becomes near, I mean, you will also talk about a terminal two, like I mean, Bangalore Airport is talking about a terminal two now. You'll talk about a terminal two or a different um, um, stack itself, right? So you'll do all of them. So enablers go hand in hand with the business features or a stories or epics at the same time. Idea is it should be a collaboration effort where architect and the product manager or solution manager or your LPM, Lean Portfolio Managers, they talk together and see what should go first and what should go next, right? So I build the architecture, I add the feature. I build the next set of uh, infrastructure or compliance mechanisms, and then I add the feature, right? So how should it go hand in hand? It's about the enabler. So enablers, I mean, build the runway for you. It's about like somebody is paving the road for you and you are running a little behind so that I mean, you are able to run seamlessly. The idea is the team should not get stuck on, okay, I need to build this pattern or I need to think about this design pattern. I need to add an infrastructure. Now suddenly it comes uh, out of from nowhere. It's a collaborative effort. And what we see on the ground is if you are a greenfield project, mostly you would be doing a lot of enablers to start with, maybe 80, 90% of the enablers and um, very less features. And over a period of time, it kind of balances it out. And maybe if it kind of goes into a maintenance or a 
a long term mode your enablers become less and less its features gets added more and more right so that's always an adjustment it's not a one over the other and and believe me and when we do a wsj for a weighted shortage job first um we don't differentiate between a business feature and an enabler we kind of look at both of them as equal what if you know two or three features have the same wish jeff i think i mean one of the videos uh, kind of talks about it say mostly why do you do wsjf um, you want to prioritize features uh, you have ample number of features maybe i mean say i'll just take for an example you have 20 features but you with the capacity and the historical data what you know is i can take only 10 of them in the next pi right i want to take up highest priority items which can be done at a faster pace uh, but all i want to know from ms jeff is out of these 20 what are the top 10 right and actually i am not worried too much about the number if you ask me i am not worried too much about the number i tell it in my classes uh, what i am worried about is the quality of discussion that happens to come to a conclusion on that number so why user business value is high for a feature why time criticality is high for a feature or why this much of an effort is needed the moment uh, the business says okay cost of delay is a higher one but you are saying it takes too much of a time can i break it them down maybe there i mean there is always an opportunity for you to break one feature into two feature and go ahead right so maybe i mean you want to do that one right so for me the top 10 feature is maybe what is important so whatever wisdom number comes in i'm maybe okay only thing is i mean where um, say 9th 10th and 11th feature come with the same wsjf and i want to select only 10 of them uh, that's where maybe i'll want to elaborate on those three features maybe once more elaborate and get more data on that features and remember wsjf also is a continuous prioritization as and when you get more data you add the number you change the number you update the number till you go to the pi planning till that day you have an option to change the numbers and that's where um my recommendation also is if you can take only 10 features don't elaborate only 10 features maybe elaborate 10 or 13 features because i mean on the pi planning day you might come up with this conclusion that feature number 9 is no more required what do you do then i mean do you want to kind of suddenly pull up feature number 11 and uh, search for answers maybe not i mean team is already prepared for two or three more features than what it can take i mean try to put try to think more but at the same time make sure that you are not loading over the capacity and idea is about transparency guys i mean idea is about transparency as a team i'm telling the product management that i can take up two features but i'll also elaborate the third feature just in time just in case i'll take up two one two of them but during the pi planning if i come to know that the second feature has a lot of dependencies i will do only one and a half features maybe second feature i'll break it them down and do only half of them right so those are all possibilities uh, wsjf just don't look at as a number it's a fight between or a battle between <laughs> business architects and your product managers to really come up with what's the right priority for my organization nothing more than that nice point i'm saying to discover more about the future don't worry about the numbers now shay the next question is now what framework is safe recommending for hardware teams is it scrum or kanban <laughs> once you answer that i have a follow up question too <laughs> it is about I mean, what do you want right so um start from somewhere again uh, don't get hung up with a uh, methodology or a framework i mean again we're talking about safe i mean even then i'm telling you uh, even for safe i mean don't get hung up that okay, i have to implement safe so don't start from that place right so start from a place that uh, what you can achieve and what is uh, available with you and typically i mean we know that with the kanban if you can't really have a backlog too much uh, refined uh, if you can't even think about the next two weeks it's kind of continuous flow and you want to manage the flow maybe you start with kanban if you can think about two weeks three weeks four weeks again uh, because it's hardware i will take a, a different viewpoint of three or a four week iteration i mean if i can do it um, i have manufacturing facilities i mean which can help me do that one right um i'll go ahead with that one i'll go ahead with the scrum first and then maybe uh, think about changing it to kanban if it doesn't work or start with the kanban and if it kind of uh, becomes structured i will go for scrum maybe right so but change once 
don't change too many times i mean don't kind of say okay scrum kanban scrum ban whatever is kan scrum whatever is right so i don't know so uh, start from somewhere uh, in a pure way but evolve over a period of time your retrospective should help you more than that so we are saying that during say for teams training we've gotten a lot of questions about how kanban teams participate in pi planning or and the mm. iteration planning right? mm. so i would love to hear more about your experience on how to ensure these teams are integrated in a meaningful way mm. that both support the art pi planning but also where the kanban agile teams isn't wasting yeah. their time yeah wasting <laughs> so, i would i would look at this way i mean if there is a kanban team i mean maybe mostly they are into operations maintenance or um, like work continuously flowing from for them from other teams mostly right so if that's a the case they will be greatly benefited knowing what other teams are doing doing in the next um, four to five iterations right so that's where a planning pa planning definitely they are part of it uh, they would collaborate and look at uh, maybe i mean more than their planning they will be with other teams to really see what are the dependencies they might have uh, maybe what are the release dates uh, what are the scheduled integration points right so they will look at that and also they will make an assumption that okay if this feature is going to get released at this point in time uh, i need to have this much of a time uh, for my maintenance activities right so that's one point another point is even the kanban teams will have their own improvements i mean their own backlog right so small backlog which might be taking 20% 30% of their capacity they might want to plan for them and showcase them in a transparent way saying that um team we have 20% of our capacity already taken out for these activities and these are the 60% 70% active uh, time that we have uh, what do you have for us right so that that's the second thing that we want to do and from a team perspective when they go back to their teams uh, planning do they do i would leave it leave it up to them um kanban doesn't prescribe any separate planning meeting i mean it's a continuous flow they will do it but what i would want them to do is a demo whatever they have accomplished in the last two weeks a uh, demo it out again they would have been continuously demoing out uh, to their stakeholders maybe in a smaller chunks but as a team demo it out and make sure that the system teams are picking up your work and getting it integrated for the system demo system demo is crucial right so this kanban teams whatever they have delivered it could be a fix uh, it could be a maintenance activity it could be an infrastructure i mean whatever they have delivered integrating them becomes an important issue so system demo is a, a really a place where we want to see whatever work the kanban team has done is constantly integrated again if it is a daily builds and you don't even have a question of a separate system demo where you have to be uh, really uh, involved but we are taking a neutral view point of your organization is slowly moving from a, a three months cadence to a one month cadence to a two week cadence to a maybe every day build cadence over a next one or two years i mean if you that's a case maybe integrating uh, continuously is imp- important and i think retrospectives um while kanban may not prescribe and it could be a daily um, thing uh, on a real kanban team where you are constantly looking at what are your ways and constantly improving and why not have a retrospective for at a team level again if it makes sense do have that one otherwise i mean for me uh, integration is something you have to be very careful about constantly showcasing the demo and making sure that the right things get integrated at the right time other than that safe also doesn't prescribe go ahead with what is uh, really important for you but don't skip the inspect and adapt workshop which is a retrospective for the train sorry i mean just to add on i mean two days of pa planning uh, if you are part of it i would not say it as a wastage of time but maybe i mean it is about really understanding the integrities and maybe you can help other teams to um, unearth some of the problems that you would see right maybe right so that could help other teams right so and uh, trust me in, in many of the consulting assignments that i have done wherever some of the scrum teams are falling behind i take the kanban teams help that okay you guys are little relatively have some time i mean why don't go and help that team if you have that skills so ashwini now since uh, you were talking about effectively using the uh, you know inspect and adapt workshop i think there's a lot of curiosity on what metrics to use 
for the effective, you know, to measure the effective noise of an art. Mm -hmm. Yes, we do have this planned versus actual business value. But apart mm -hmm. from that, uh, do you see organizations using any other metrics to measure team performance? Yeah. Um, I think fair pick picture is a nice place now. Uh, the metrics tab uh, earlier, I also didn't like it too much because I mean, it was calling out number of story points, how much achieved and stuff, right? Uh, now we kind of think about three points. One is the outcome based metrics. I mean, it could be about your net promoter score, uh, your employee engagement scores, uh, or uh, actual profit from the market and stuff, right? So that could be one thing. The second one is a flow metrics. This is where, I mean, you might measure lead time, you might measure the cycle time, you might measure the process time, you, but you are thinking about the value stream mapping. The third one is mostly the competency based, I mean, which is a, a self-assessment, right? So you are looking at a core competencies and how are we doing on each of them? And uh, everything is a recommendation from SAFE. The metrics page, I mean, if you go to the um, SAFE website, scaleagileframework.com on the right um, spanning palette, at the bottom, you have the metrics tab. Just click on that. Everything is a, a suggestion and a recommendation, right? So it's not that I mean you can measure one over the other. Uh, maybe start from a point where what matters for your organization from maybe product perspective, business perspective, and technical perspective. Look at three perspectives. Again, my bias suggestion. Uh, what matters for you, start measuring them. And another thing I also say is don't measure the metrics in isolation. Just looking at automation percent doesn't help you. Maybe, I mean, you have to connect the automation percentage into how many defects you found out because of automation and how good is your build today. Or um, employee score with how many employees are actually leaving the organization, right? So, I mean, employee happiness index might show 90%, but I mean, there is 50% attrition. I mean, it doesn't correlate, right? So look at, I mean, the, uh, the measures, I mean, which will actually cement that uh, your data. Right. I mean, look at that one. And the last suggestion is look at both the quantitative and qualitative metrics. Uh, for me, quantitative metrics is numbers, hard numbers, uh, how much I sold, how many percentage automation, how many story points and stuff. Qualitative metrics is mostly my thinking and feeling, uh, what the team feels like, what is going well uh, from a core competency and the dimensions perspective and uh, even from an employee engagement and staff perspective, right? So kind of try to correlate both. And I actually don't have a one answer which can fit all the organizations, right? Uh, take that, uh, the whole page metrics page as a starting point. And maybe you want to read uh, Lean Startup from Eric Reis as well, that he talks about another 100 metrics <laughs> that you can start thinking about. Uh, again, don't overload yourself with too many metrics and numbers, um, I think. Many of us, uh, at least this part of the world, are good with numbers and good with math, and we love to kind of divide and multiply and add and subtract. Uh, don't do that one too much, uh, but at the same time, think about what matters for you and start from there. So measure what matters. Uh, that's John Doerr's book from OKR and um, Lean Startup from Eric Rice. I am from the finance department and would like to know how SAFE includes finance and related teams into the program. Mm -hmm. And the, the chat also has a similar question no? for SAFE agile transformation for finance department. Mm -hmm. uh, I know more emphasis would be on Kanban uh, just in time practices or LPM, but would like to hear from you on what we can propose for a finance team. Yeah. Again, uh, they should be part of the audience. Uh, maybe some of the SMEs, again, uh, if finance may not be an entire team, right? Depending on the context, again, uh, you have some uh, budgeting related stuff or, I mean, you have some um, adjustments to money or something. I mean, maybe finance team is there as a one of the business owners. Maybe they participate as, they can participate as a business owner in that context, right? Or uh, finance is working across the organization. Can they be a shared services team? Definitely, yes. Again, um, they would decide whether all the team members go or some of the SMEs go and participate in the um, release train activities, I mean, PA planning and other activities. Uh, that's where, I mean, they might look at as a shared services team. But if it is majority uh, finance is involved, they are also part of the train as a team, right? So they are also part of the train as a team. I mean, that's the third uh, way that I'm talking about. Finance 
participates as one team or marketing participates at one team think about this uh, if you are a retail company you are selling some stuff uh, during december or the christmas season or the holiday seasons a uh, marketing team plays a crucial role they need to know when the features are getting into a market they need to be aware of when we start kick start our campaigns marketing team as a whole is on your train they would have their kanban at the same time what they will be interested on is the milestones if you remember the program board they'll be interested on the milestones they'll be instead of interested on the help they need to give to the other teams and the help they need from the other teams right so they would participate as a team itself they are part of the train they are no not outside of the train and if there are you know these different agile teams of an art who are from different partner organizations hmm. and from you know they have this different contracts so, so can we form an art taking from these different organizations i mean you are violating a basic um, agile value customer collaboration over contract negotiation becomes called contract negotiation over customer collaboration i mean now and the problem starts from there right um, again all the successful organizations that i have seen um, they treat all the vendors contractors as their own right so the moment there is a two different contracts and uh, like development is done by someone and testing is done by someone and you do the pa planning also separately for development and testing you are violating basic uh, rules of common sense itself so to say mm-hmm. maybe right so that's where the problem starts and that's where the pitch is always towards a managed contract uh, again uh, agile contracts when managed contracts i mean what is my role and responsibility as a customer what is your role as a vendor and what are the shared responsibilities if it is not clear nothing else works out on the ground again my biased opinion nothing else works out on the ground and it's all in theory right i would say that one but even if that's a contract as of now i mean why not get everyone to a same room and create that alignment and maybe uh, like charity should begin at home right so the leaders i mean who are who have written those contracts i mean should start thinking about a new way of working and over a period of time and many a times it's a reality that say i have written a contract with preet for one year and i have written another contract with satyajit for one year i can't change that contract i mean by way of I mean, because of the gdpr or whatever whatever restrictions right in that case maybe what i'll do is yes um, um, uh, preet and satyajit yes contract exists but at the same time I mean, why not we collaborate and find a common ground i want you both of you to be in the room um, try to figure out i mean three of them three of us try to figure out what's the right path for us again within the contracts and maybe can i add an appendix stating okay these are the changes that i'm going going to do and these are the penalty or these are the rewards that i'm going to give you right so can we start from there i think somebody has to start somewhere right so i would say that our organization is on the way to adapt safe hmm. all the leaders took the agility training Hmm. So the question is, apart from holding these cadence events, what is the most important thing to do to effectively adopt safe? See, leadership involvement is um, should be continuous. I mean, I would say that one. So I took a safe agilist training, and uh, if I tell the uh, teams that okay, from tomorrow you handle the things, I mean, it's not the thing, right? So I think safe agilist training also starts. I mean, the first lesson ends with uh, Deming's quote: "Such a responsibility cannot be delegated," right? um if you want the quality of the quality and productivity i mean you have to do it yourself so as a leader i mean what is my role uh, my role is about vision mission roadmap right so i need to have a clarity around the roadmap and um maybe articulate it um maybe through the architects through the product managers i articulate that roadmap that's one thing and show constant involvement pa planning i am present not just to brief for the one hour and rush off but for the two days and um i think i mean last one of the classes me and preet were uh, high spc class that we were having and we kind of came out with uh, one suggestion that if a leader is busy they can still be part of the pa planning and they can also tell at the end i am going to be there in the next cabin next to here i have some work to do but at the same time if you want to want me to answer something come and knock on my door you are my first priority and every other work i'll push it as a second priority if i'm doing something right so can we as a leader showcase that transparency 
showcase that empathy towards the teams uh, that okay i i care and i uh, i value you right so that's the second thing and at least in the system demos do participate do participate in the system demos and give a feedback give a right feedback what is going well i mean what is not going well I mean, what do you see as a change that is required right and last part inspect and adapt oh, workshop own up things as a leader i mean own up things i mean if there are certain things uh, that needs uh, budgeting that needs uh, your intervention you call out i will own this thing rather than kind of pushing it back to the teams right so that's from the leadership perspective i think i mean from the team perspective it doesn't change too much i mean what you have been doing you will do it but in an iterative way and also uh, focus mostly on the retrospective items and we always have a problem of again uh, doing this uh, second sin of not doing the retrospective uh, if you might ask me what is the highest sin highest sin is doing the retrospective back to back but having that action item list ever growing right not not actually looking at it and constantly adding things to the action item what's your guidance if the business keeps changing the priorities mid pi and they are not un- they are not understanding the impact uh, of this and also one of our customers is setting up some chaotic environment that their mm-hmm. arts are not in sync in i think it's a specific business related problem or organization specific problem but yeah yeah true again um, i would say i mean you might not have gone through the implementation road map correctly right so one thing could be about leaders not trained another thing could be about uh, lace or something of that sort formed which really took a priority what is a priority right because when i launched the first start i need four factors one is the lo- leadership support another one is there should be a clear vision for the product i mean i am not saying i mean all the features should be ready but should we should be a clear vision and a road map for the product there should be a value that i want to get out of it and the last thing is teams know about agility i mean they have experienced agility a little bit right and if one of them is not there maybe you want you should have spent a little bit time to actually refine their backlogs I and mean, get to the uh, place where you have the vision and the road map clarified so that maybe you should have launched the train one month later or two months later that could have helped you right and if the teams are changing too often so if a covid like situation happens 2020 march i understand right so suddenly such sort of things i mean change the world changes upside down or uh, you are changing the priority yes i mean we can always maybe cancel the pi or look at the pi as half done and plan only for the half a pi and whatever it is uh, takes but if you are constantly changing call them call that one it in, in the ind inspect and adapt and call out i mean if this is the kind of change that we are looking at it how do we even move forward right so make it visible maybe as a scrum master you need to make it visible at a team level rt's responsibility is to make it visible to the management to, to the organizations right so organization to um call out the business impact now in scrum hmm. we can cancel a sprint when the sprint goal becomes obsolete hmm. right what is an equivalent situation when you are dealing with a pi which i think is very much related to the question that we discussed just now yeah. again um one liner blind answer is cancel the pi right but at the same time it is going to be a costly affair for you right uh, because um 150 people have come together they work for two days to plan ahead for that one and you are also run for three weeks say i mean think about it in 10 out of the 10 weeks i mean you have worked for three weeks and suddenly you realize that uh things have gone different um ideally maybe i mean you cancel the pi and do a pi planning once again right um that that is a theoretical answer but at a practical sense a few things that to take care few things that you can you can do right one is why it has changed uh, i have seen uh, in one of my consultant during the covid right so suddenly i mean world changed upside down I and mean, you have to change your direction what do you do we were half way through two sprints were done almost done so what we did was uh, we did a one day pa planning for the next two sprints we kept the cadence as is saying that okay two sprints are done next three sprints let's take it as a mini pi let's take it as a mini pi right so uh, we completely revamped changed the plans for those three uh, iterations we knew uh, whatever said and done the first two iterations whatever we have done some things could go some things could not go because of the change situation but the next three uh, iterations 
I mean, we could plan uh, differently. We also made sure that we are not uh, allocating the entire 100% capacity because we didn't even know how do you work, right? So it was also a hardware dependent uh, team. So, I mean, you could not really think about, I mean, how who will come to office, who will not come to office, right? So we kept aside some uh, buffer. We planned that way. And we completed that PI. And in fact, I mean, IP iteration was cut down and converted into a, a general iteration with the 50% uh, capacity loading. And by that time, uh, the business could evolve a strategy for the next PI, which was very, very different from the original roadmap that was given. So the leader uh, did a, um, a two hour all hands meeting. And um, I think towards the last uh, iteration, I mean, they kind of announced it. Our priorities have completely changed. I mean, we are going in a different direction. I and mean, what we called out six months back is null and void, right? For the next two PIs, I mean, we have already started, started rolling out um, the next set of features. And we know it is going to be tough. I mean, treat it like a first PI. And while we have done already five PIs, treat it like a first PI in the COVID world, right? So that's, that's a, a practical suggestion that I have. Right? So you don't lose too much, but at the same time, keep the moral of the team high. Maybe in a sprint, I mean, you will lose few days. Here you are going to lose few sprints maybe. So think about how can you minimize the blow on me. Tools, right? So what tools to use and what is your favorite, Ashwini? It, a fool with a tool is still a fool and an actually an expensive fool, <laughs> right? So, <laughs> so again, um, I don't have a favorite and I've stopped using uh, uh, every other tool other than Excel sheet <laughs> in the last two years. Um, if your organization already has a tool, if you're comfortable using that one, uh, there is always a workaround for every tool. Right. So if you're using, say, uh, simple Jira, I mean, there is always a workaround. I mean, what you can do. Right. So create multiple Kanbans, connect to them and uh, have epics and stories as uh, child and uh, parent relationship. I mean, whatever you want to do. Right. So do it. Version one, I mean, maybe, I mean, you do certain things else. Version one, I mean, people say um, planning is easy because you can also put the estimate. I mean, you can play the game and stuff. Right. So whatever works for you, I mean, take it and start from there. And don't get hung up too much on the tools. I mean, in fact, even don't get hung up on the framework also too much. Mm -hmm. Safe, Scrum, Kanban, right? So again, if you have implemented safe today, uh, do it in the right way. But two years down the line, if you are still doing the same things, uh, I'll not be happy. Say maybe, I mean, today you say, okay, PI planning looks like, I mean, they need nine days, nine hours per, uh, for two days. I'll start with the same exact number of like eight o'clock in the morning. I'll start nine o'clock. I do this one, 10 o'clock. I do this one, but the third PI, fourth PI, if you are still doing that one, I'll not be happy. Maybe, I mean, you would have evolved and said, okay, leaders have already sent their decks. Uh, there was also a question and answer session, even before the PI planning day. So that, I mean, we can, instead of spending four hours, we can spend five hours for the teams to solve their dependencies. Right. So maybe you would have evolved that way. Right. So I think you started with a nice quote about using the tool. But again, you know, talking about the tool, uh, I think our next set of uh, safe episodes are going to be on different tools. So we call it cool tools. So mm. the next safe Thursday is going to be on the PI planning IO. Yep. We'll be that's, a, that's a nice one. That's a nice one. And in fact, I mean, some of the RTs developed that tool for their problem statement, right? So that's where, I mean, it's, very, very specific to PA planning and safe, right? So it, it helps you. And uh, we actually have the head of products from, no? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So he's coming in and he's going to give us a demo about how to use the PI planning app itself. That's awesome. Again, yeah. every tool is awesome. If you ask me, I mean, Jira's version ones and PA planning, I would, I mean, even uh, think about a simple Excel sheet to anything. I mean, how do you use it? It matters. I have an organization, a large organization. I mean, I will not name them. They manage everything in Excel sheet. I mean, all the requirements they manage in Excel sheet and they're, they're pretty cool about it. Right? So connected Excel sheets and it's easily shareable on Google Docs. Uh, edit permissions are easy to give or revoke, right? So they do, do, it, do it pretty well without even spending a penny about one or two. And they know the limitations as well. I mean, you can't track. I mean, you can't track certain things. I mean, you can't get the pull out the... Uh, magical uh, burn up, burn down charts from there and stuff. But 
I think I mean they have evolved over that one. They are now no longer looking at story points, no longer looking at a burn down chart, rather looking at what's the value that you provide. Thank you, Ashwini. Thank you very much, and thank you all for the questions. I know there are a few more questions that we have not been able to get to, so yeah. but we are keeping a track of all the questions. Right, we will definitely try and see how versed that we can get the questions answered. Right, and if you really need, you know, just head over to our websites, you know, safeThursday dot com. And then, look, keep sending in your questions, and then we will try and see how to get all of those things answered, right? And no, Ashwini, um, no, is a very good friend, and he has been supporting us a lot. So I know how to, you no, know, pick Ashwini's brain and get you the answers as yeah, needed. Definitely, always, always available. Yeah. So please um, keep sending in your questions, and then we will try and get all those things answered.